Okay. Uh, my name is Michael Scarabin. I'm an orchestrator and a, a musician. I live in Mount Kisco. Uh, I've been working in the theater and film for about almost 40 years now, which makes me feel a little old saying that number. Um, but I'm happy to be here and to talk to you about what I do and answer some questions and show you some scores. Even if you don't read music, you may find it interesting. Um, people usually ask, what is an orchestrator? Well, the simplest explanation of it is I take a composer's piano part and put instruments on it. Because um, most songwriters in particular are not orchestrators. They just play the piano. Maybe they write lyrics or work with a lyricist. Um, and in the theater, there's no time for them to write an orchestration for the whole orchestra to play their score because they're busy making last minute changes in rehearsals as the show is in production. And so it's a job that goes to somebody else. And even in film music, someone like John Williams, who was conducting that last track you heard, which was um, Colors of the Wind, um, uh, in an orchestration that I did. He started as an orchestrator, but when he composed most of his famous scores, he was not able to do all of that work because he, um, he was busy writing the score at the last minute and trying to get it done. So he has a series of different orchestrators who help him do that. Um, and so it's developed into a job for a single person. Um, as I said before, orchestration simply is just putting instruments onto a piano part. But for me in the theater, it's much, much more. It's telling a story. And to me, that is the focus of all my work is telling a story. It's a focus of every designer in the, in, in the theater is that we're telling the story that through costumes, through sets, and in my case, through orchestral color. Um, and so you're bringing more than just color for musical reasons, you're bringing color for dramatic reasons to tell a story. And so in order to show that, I wanted to show you a song from a lesser known show, a show called Renaissance. Um, Renaissance is was a poem by um, Edna St. Vincent Millay, and it was the name of her first collection of poetry. And a friend of mine, Carmel Dean, wrote a show about Edna St. Vincent's life. And in that show, all the lyrics are Millay's poetry set to music, but they're acting out her life around it and how the poems, not necessarily when they were written, are they sung, but how they relate to the events of her wild and crazy life she lived, she grew up in Maine, but came to New York and lived quite an artist life, to put it in one way, in the 1920s. Um, and her poetry was quite successful and quite wonderful. Um, and I'm gonna play you the song first from a workshop. For those of you who are not in the theater, a workshop is before you do the full production, you try the show out first, just for about 10 people in a room. And you do it with just a piano because you wanna see, I need a, if you're gonna to need to rewrite things, if you're gonna to need to change things, it's a test performance. So this is a recording of a song called Beanstalk, which is a poem Malay wrote about climbing a beanstalk and so many other things. And in this song, well, I don't want to tell you about the song. I think you'll discover it for yourself. But what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, the screen is going to show the piano part with the singer. So you can, if you don't read music, you can follow along with the lyrics. But the thing to try and do is try to pay attention to the figures in the piano uh, because this, the poem talks very much about wind and, and shaking um, as a metaphor for what this character is going through. And Carmel in her piano part caught some of that movement. So there's, there's a constant amount of movement through what we call 16th notes in this song that you'll see. 
So um, I'm going to show you this song now. Uh, let me just open it up in the share and we'll listen to it. Here we go. Um, really wonderful, wonderful performance. You almost hear it and think, oh, with a singer like that, who even needs an orchestration? I mean, it, and, you know, the piano is full of all that movement. Um, you almost, almost don't need an orchestra for that song to work, in my opinion. But as an orchestrator, what a challenge. I'm going to have to come up with the wind. I'm going to have to be as passionate as this voice. Before we go on to the score, are there questions? I realize people might have some questions about what I do in general. Unmute yourself and ask a question if you want to. No, everyone's pretty set where they are. Okay, then let, let's go look at the score. Uh, so, this show was done downtown off Broadway, but we were fortunate enough to have an eight piece orchestra for it. Uh, I had a violin and a cello. I had one woodwind and a French horn. I had two keyboards. I had a harp and a bass. The two keyboards are synthesizers. One plays just a piano sound the whole time. And the other plays different, different keyboard sounds that mix with the harp and the piano 
So I can take those moving notes that you saw in the piano part and expand them even more. Now, here are some of the things to look for. When I write an orchestration, one of the things I try to do is a singer sings in a lyric in phrases. Those phrases are two to four bars. They car usually correspond to a sentence. Sometimes there's two sentences, four sentences. Then they have to take a breath. But to me, an actor doesn't, the character doesn't stop feeling and being passionate while they're breathing. So it's very important for me between their lines to carry their thought forward, to carry their emotion forward. So it keeps sweeping along. So it's like if they're getting going down a trough because they're breathing a breath, the wave has, keeps pushing them along. So look how I feel between the lines that she's singing. She's singing exactly what you heard before. The piano is playing essentially what you just heard. Everything else is things I've added, lines in between, lines to thicken the piano with the harp to make more movement. One point you'll hear harp glisses. So we're gonna do this. And if you're having trouble finding your place in the score, the lyric is there on, on one of the lines. And so you can just follow along with that. So let's share that and listen to it. Um, here we go. And this is from the cast recording. Here we go. That's essentially the number. Um, we can see here, if I turn to just this page, um, uh, 
this is the one here. Um, you can see that the wind, the wind is blowing so, and the scale carries me through into, and the scale here carries me through into the next line. And then this figure carries me into the next measure. And here she cries out, ah, ah. And you know, this the strings and the woodwinds join in to help her cry. Now there's some building lines. In the meantime, all this movement is going on to keep the wind swirling underneath her in the piano and in the keyboard. And it gets thicker here with fuller chords. Then I start doing some climbing scales here um, because we're going into on the next page a windier section. Um, so she goes, I clutched a stalk and jabbered do -do -de -do -de -de -do -de 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 with my eyes shut blind. Another fill, da 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 da. What a wind! And the horn goes boo, which is a rip, which where he, in this case, she plays all the notes in between the two notes as she glisses from one to the other. So let, let me just play this one page for you, having gone into it in specific. The wind was blowing so, and my teeth were in a row, dry and gritting, and I felt my foot slip. Ah, 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 and I scratched the wind and whined, and I clutched the stalk and jabbered, with my eyes shut blind. So that's an attempt to sort of give you an idea of the kind of things I'm trying to bring to underneath this vocal to, to bring emotion, to keep forward motion going. Um, any questions at all? No? Questions about theater orchestration? I have a question. Sure. I have a question. Just to clarify, so you you take that piano piece and then you write the violin piece, you write the oboe piece, you write every other piece that there is. Yes. And you give them that sheet music. Well, someone else, I actually, what I, the thing that I create is this, what you're looking at, this physical score. Uh, I do it in a digital notation program. Um, as the composer wrote her piano part in the digital notation program. And then I give it to a third person, a copyist, the music copyist, whose okay. job it is to take my score and make the parts and put them in front. Okay, yes. okay. Yeah, that's what I wanted to know. Thank you. Yeah, that's okay. Um, it's a, a very time intensive thing. Uh, I used to do it by hand. This is kind of digital notation really came about mm, started appearing in the 90s, but didn't really become useful till about 2003, four or five. Now all music is written this way, um, at least in film and television and uh, theater, everyone notates digitally. Um, and I had it. Go ahead. Oh, sorry to interrupt. I just had a question about what sure. um, you do use. Are you on Sibelius or? Uh, I'm on Finale. Finale, okay. Yes, I'm on Finale. Uh, it's where I started. It's where most of the theater is. Um, London is a Sibelius city. Sibelius is what's taught in most of the schools. The musical theater here in New York seems to have adopted Finale almost universally, but most copyists okay. can work in both. Um, and it's gotten so you can pretty much transfer a file between the two at this point. Um, pretty cleanly. You'll have to clean it up after uh, through something called XML. The programs speak to each other now quite well. Um, Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, would your job be substantially different if you were working in opera? Yes, it would be in that most composers in opera do orchestrate their own um, their own scores. Okay. If, they're, if they're inexperienced composers, they might get help, but for the most part, they would. But the difference is a composer is gonna take three, four years to write an opera. When he brings it in, no one's gonna say, oh, I wish this character did this. I wish this character did that. Opera is less a 
um, a collaborative endeavor. It's the composer's world. The director is brought in to stage it. The st singers come in to sing it, but it's the composer's vision that's there. And so people don't really show up to rewrite it. So he has time to sit at home and orchestrate it. It's not gonna change. Musical theater, like film, is very different in that it's a commercial art form, which means people want it to be right because they wanna make money. Um, being a commercial art form embraces everything from the avant-garde to Sondheim to the more commercial jukebox shows, which is why I like commercial theater. But it forces you to be honest in a way that I think contemporary opera doesn't, um, in that it, it, you, they're not worried about whether the audience will accept the piece as much. Um, so because of that collaborative experience in that four weeks of rehearsal, which is the time I have to write the orchestration for a two and a half hour show, um, many changes will occur. People will say, this number just doesn't work. Let's do it. Or we just, we're finding the show is really about this. Or if it's a more commercial show, they're saying, oh, people get bored here. We're going to lose this ballot. You know, it, the range varies from what kind of piece you're working on. Um, that's interesting. Can I ask one more question? Sure. That's what I'm here for. What was orchestration like before computers and synthesizers? It was all by hand. And as someone who has absolutely no fine arts ability, I never could draw. I, I always got C's in penmanship. It was a struggle for me to write a score that was clear. It was also a wonderful thing when I finished a, a page that I knew would sound good to look at it and go, look at what, there was a sense of having created something with my hands, which I, I have lost that sense of creating a physical object with my hands by doing it on the computer. However, because of my bad handwriting and my struggle to make it clear, I can write so much faster because I'm not fighting my inability to draw. Um, uh, there's also things like if you're left-handed, some left-handed people when they're scoring write the music backwards when they used to do it in ink. Because if you write it, if, if you're a left-handed, you're writing this way, your arm is smearing the ink as you're going across the page. So, yes. some, so, so some people learn to score their music backwards Amazing. in order to not smear. But we, I, I always wrote in pencil uh, 0.7 graphite, uh, HB leads. Um, it, it was, you know, and uh, it was a whole world you did. And copyists would copy in ink um, and they had beautiful, and, and it was like calligraphy. They had beautiful penmanship, but they could do it quite fast. Um, and the skills completely changed over. The musical skills are all still there and still necessary but the graphic skills completely change to something that you're doing on a computer. Um, but wouldn't have been, wouldn't it have been different from the music perspective, just because you couldn't use a synthesizer to hear the other parts? Like would orchestrators have had to have had different skill sets or play more instruments before they had synthesizers and computers? What makes you think I listen to it now that I'm writing it in digital notation? I don't play it back because I did learn that I had to depend on just what I was playing on. Your playback was the piano. I'm writing this oboe line. And the key was, as I write the oboe line, I had to hear the oboe color in my head. Hmm. To know, and I had to know the rules of how to write for oboe that that's too low and it'll sound like that and the flute will be too shrieky up there. Maybe I should use a piccolo. So all that knowledge is still required because if you use synthesizers to play it back, synths aren't exactly the same as live players. You can't do the manipulation. So I can always tell when someone wrote a harp part for a synth harp because they wrote just a piano part on a harp texture, which a harp is too ringy in the middle it sound rings too long. 
So if you write it like a piano, it's all muddy. Those are things you learn as a musician that using synthesizers to play back your sound is very misleading. Now, one does learn how to manipulate those synth sounds because there's a certain amount of work you do online. Um, people want to hear your mo movie cue before you record it now in, on synthesizers to decide if they like it so that you can make changes before you show up to the studio. It used to be you just showed up to the studio and they go, well, I want this, this, and this. And you go, I can only change that and that because we're here already. You know, now they, now they want full control. So they want to hear your movie cue ahead of time so they can make you ask you to make all the changes. So yeah, the playback is a tool that's useful. It's also if you're doing something for television or like they're, the kids are all writing Zoom, little Zoom musicals now while we're in COVID. And they, they've been great for that to record a little band without having to get people into a studio. So my feeling about technology in general, technology is a great tool. When a new tool like synthesis appears or sampling, um, it's overused, it's used too much but then it folds into where it should be as a tool we can use. There was synthesizer in that orchestra I played for you, but it wasn't predominantly there. It was just on the keyboard, coloring it and filling out with the acoustic instruments shining on the top where I wanted them to appear. So that's a way, did I overuse the synth early on? Sure, it was a fad, it was the new thing, it was hip, it sounded great but I learned to fold it in as a tool that's still useful in an eight piece band to give me a sense of fullness underneath while letting the acoustic instruments shine on the top. Interesting, thank you. That's okay. Anyone else? I can play another score if we'd like. I think, I think we'll do that. Um, I have a score from a musical I worked on called Sunday in the Park. Um, oh, I Someone, someone wants to hear that. Great. So this is um, uh, this is uh, uh, what I'll do is I'll play. I won't play the whole um, the whole piano vocal version. I'll play just a little bit of that for you. Um, let me open that first. Um, and Sunday in the Park was a musical about George Surratt. Um, it's a wonderful musical and that the whole first act is him assembling, is him taking sketches in the park of what's going to become his great masterpiece, Le, Le Grand Jacques. Um, and it's about his model called, whose name is Dot, which if you know that Surratt was a pointillist who painted in dots, and that was the sort of little inside joke. Um, but then the second act, is about a mythical great grandson of Surratt who's at an artistic crossroads. He's a performance artist who's been making these art installations and they've become very empty. They're, they're very impressive. They're called chromalooms, um, but they're empty. And he's really confused at what to do. And Dot, the model from of his great grandfather appears to him in a vision and tells him it's time for him to move on to something else, but to, to, to trust his vision. Well, I don't wanna do the lyrics for, for Stephen Sondheim. He does them better than anyone else. So I'm gonna play you a little first, same thing of just what Sondheim wrote. This, is, um, uh, this was a version, just a performance done uh, in Zoom recently by the stars of the recent revival, um, Jake Gyllenhaal and I'm blanking on Anne, Anna, Lee, Anna Lee's last name. Anyway, we'll, we'll look at just a little of the piano vocals so you can sort of see what Sondheim wrote. All right, let's share. Uh, Oh, that didn't open. Hang on, give me a second. Um, it is open there. 
share. Hmm, I wonder why it's not showing. There we go. I may skip a little here at the beginning. Oh no, I didn't do the intro, great. Are you working on something new? No, I am not working on anything new. That is not like you, George. I have nothing to say. You have many things. Well, nothing that's not been said. said by you, I George. do not know where to go. Nor did I. I want to make things that count. Things I that will be new. To do. What am I to do? Choosing was not. You have to move on. Look at what you want, not at where you are, not at what you'll be. Look at all the things you've done for me. Opened up my eyes. Tell me how to see. Understand the light. Understand the light. I want to move now. on. I want to explore the light. I want to know how to get through through to something new. Something of my own. Move on. Things I hadn't looked at until now, now I'm on the hat, and you sang, and the color of your hair, and the way you catch them. All right, I, I, I don't want to have you listen to the whole thing twice. It's an amazing song. If you don't know Sunday in the Park, um, you should you should try to see a good production of it sometime. Uh, it will be this production that we did recently with Jake uh, and Annalie will be happening in London. Um, they were hoping this May, but obviously that's not going to happen. Um, so probably sometime next year. But what you can see here is that because Seurat is a pointillist painter, what Sondheim has done is he's done these rush of notes and figures to be his musical equivalent of um, of Surratt's painting. It's more obvious in some other songs, like one called Color and Light, um, where he's literally painting in time to the music. Um, but these figures flow and, and they're a little dissonant and turbulent till she first says over here, move on. And that's the moment where it sort of bursts through. And it's, it's, it's a wonderful journey of an artist in confusion being pulled through, not to what he's going to do, but to, to the assurance that there is something to do and he will be able to find it. So let's, let's go and open up the score. So what I did, the piano is essentially playing that version of, that you heard with no change. And so I've created everything that goes around it Come on, open. There you go. Um, everything that goes around it 
um, to, to really more capture the emotions of these two people. Um, their, his turbulence, her assurance of him, and as we reach the climax of the number, which I did not play, his, his glory in, in the possibility of artistic creation. Um, to just put it plainly. Um, this is a version I did uh, for a, a production in Paris. Uh, the accompaniment was for a 42 piece orchestra played by the Radio France Orchestra at the Chatelet Theater. Um, the, it is in English because it was a British cast performing it. Uh, and here it is. It's good to see you. Not that I ever forgot you, George. You gave me so much. What did I give you? Many things. You taught me about concentration. At first, I thought that meant just being still. But I was to understand it meant much more. You meant to tell me to be where I was, not someplace in the past or the future. I worried too much about tomorrow. I thought the world could be perfect. I was wrong. What about you? Are you working on something new? No. I'm not working on anything new. That is not like you, George. I've nothing to say. You have many things. Well, nothing that's not been said. Said by you. I do you? not know where to go. And nor did I. I want to make things that count. Things I that did do. what I had to do. What am I to do? Something in the sky, in the grass, or behind the tree. Look at all the things you gave to me. Things I hadn't looked at till now. Flower on your hat and your smile. I would be so kind.
for you, then it will be me. Give us more to see.